Hey, a pleasant good day, everybody. Welcome into the Sports Fanatic News Sixers Talk podcast here as we're going to dive into the series coming up with our Philadelphia 76ers battling a former Philadelphia 76er, Jimmy Butler, and his Miami Heat down there in Miami. But first and foremost, Andrew, how are you doing today? Doing pretty well. Ready to get this series underway. Couldn't be more excited. Um, obviously we're in a tough situation, but the era as well, so it's going to be a fun series. Yeah, it's definitely a tough spot. You don't want to be missing your big man on campus basically until potentially game five. Some, some outlets are thinking it could be, um, game three, but also Jimmy Butler is a game time decision. Caleb Martin, Markeith Morris, all of these guys are labeled as game time decision. Same actually with PJ Tucker. I did not realize he was on that list. And then a uh, hamstring issue is bugging Kyle Lowry. So they have a lot of stuff you were hinting at, at being banged up on their front there, which I think makes sense for the Heat because they are one of the teams that, watching the Heat, they do play a injury-prone style where like they kind of play the throwback, try to be more physical than the other team, which I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I'm just saying it makes sense that they have – that like seven dudes that are banged up and then hero's illness just because when you play that style i think you know what i'm trying to say it kind of sets yourself up to get banged up more yeah and that, that's why the series is interesting kyle Lowry's is like out game one jimmy butler's dealing with his injuries so he's not fully healthy we'll see if he plays as you mentioned pj tucker so i mean i, I think I mean, Miami Heat is a an aggressive team, a hard nosed team, and, and that's it's very similar to the Sixers, and it's going to be an, an exciting series. And I think, I think even without Embiid, and he'll play in Game Three and Four. So as long as you can split out Miami, oh, you you'll be able to go back early? home. You think he'll play in three? But, well, they said today that he's out one and two, and then okay. he should be back. And a lot of optimism when he comes back for Game Three or comes back to Philly. So. Mm-hmm. I think it's a it's a situation where as long as you split get one in Miami, which James Harden's definitely capable of doing, I mean he's gonna be the best player on the floor, um, even without Embiid. So that means I take James Harden over Jimmy Butler and Kyle Lowry, especially with Jimmy Butler's health. So I mean I think it isn't out of the the out of the realm for James Harden to steal one in Miami, and then you go home, take two, and that's the, in, in Philly, and Embiid coming back because then you have the two best players on the floor. So the recipe there is for, for uh, right there for the Sixers. Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head, which is something I do. If they don't win one in Miami, they're screwed. Because then you really are putting pressure on Joel, who's not 100%, to come back and basically save you. Where if you win one in Miami, I think you are setting yourself up for good success. Even if Embiid's not back until game four, because even if you go down two to one, well, then you can tie it two to two, and then you just back at, like, basically square one again and going into the next set of games. So... I think if they can steal one, my big thing is I I believe from past track record, like you were saying, James Harden can get it done. From what I've seen of James Harden with the Sixers and Joel Embiid has even said it, I've called on this guy to be more aggressive. I haven't seen it as much here, minus the first handful of games he played. But from track record, I would say, yeah, he can get it done. But from Sixers track record, it's definitely something that is a question in my mind. Oh, see, I just dis- I disagree with that. I think um, he he took he took a couple things off in the regular season. He was trying to get acclimated with the the offense, but I think in the postseason he's been very aggressive. Yeah, he, he might go lean towards and beat a couple times rather than doing something. But to me, that's him just giving the ball to the best player on the team. So you can't fault him for that. So I think he's gonna have no problem being the aggressor, especially when it's now his team here in these first two games at least uh, against the Heat. So I don't think he'll have a problem. I'm not worried about Harden being aggressive. I'm not worried about anything like that. I mean, you, you saw him on Brooklyn when he, when Durant and them were out still. He was aggressive. So I, I really don't think that's going to play a factor. I, I think whether the Sixers can come out and steal a game or two in Miami is going to come down to the side pieces and, and who else is going to be able to help them out. Yeah. I mean, I'm not saying James Harden is definitely my biggest concern. It's just I do think there's a lot more in James Harden than he showed in the first round where he's basically turned himself since coming to the Sixers into Oscar Robertson instead of shooting to a high level consistently, which is fine. You don't need him, but, you don't need him to be. But that, that's what you, you need him to be the, the facilitator. 
Yeah, but we also need him to score more than 17. Like, like if you like, I understand we. I like him being a facilitator, but him scoring team points, like that's the only reason. If, if James Harden did better in Game Three, MB would not have had to make a ridiculous three pointer to win the game. Like he was not that good in that game. Therefore, you had to have a guy well, with a nobody was good in Game there. Three when it switched over to Toronto. Like, they they were like, they switched their defense up and it messed with everybody. I mean, MB had a bad game until that shot. Um, I mean, everybody struggled. That, that was a that was a defense to defense game. I can't blame anybody's offense on that. I mean, nobody had a good offensive game. And then, but my my point is, he to me is not like James Harden. It's kind of been echoed in the NBA circle for a while. He hasn't been as aggressive as you've seen him in the past in terms of getting it done. Maybe he still has the aggressive nature, but he hasn't got it done in terms of the great shooting percentage you're used to seeing from him, minus the final game. So if he plays a little bit more like game six, then, yeah, I think we're fine. And then he magnifies that. If he plays more like a facilitator without Joel Embiid in, well, that's not going to help any unless if – because I think Toby's been good this year because he's been very good defensively and has shot well. But I do think he could have shot more in some of those games. But that's just knowing the type of player and his personality. He's a secondary scorer. But – you can't be facilitating to secondary scores left and right when you're supposed to be the alpha dog. That's my, that's my point by it now. That's why if he's in that facilitator mindset, I'm not sure how great that's going to work without Joel compared to how it worked with Joel on the court. But you can't judge it like that. I think that's where you're misinterpreting. You can't judge it based off what he's doing with Embiid. Embiid's not on the court. Doc Rivers even said yesterday that they're going to run their offense through James Harden. Like, James Harden knows Joel Embiid isn't going to be there. Like the whole thing is going to switch. And again, I think he's been aggressive since he's been uh, since the postseason started. Uh, I don't think. He I don't really, think he's been I mean, unaggressive. I just think he's been ineffective minus the final game. I don't think he was. I completely disagree with that. You don't win that. You don't win that. I mean, you, Harden couldn't have done much more in that series. He had double double in almost every series, in almost every game. I think. Yeah, but there's double doubles that are like, like we, we we can't give Harden the credit for having 13 and 12 double doubles when the same people insulted Simmons for having the 13. Like there's certain double doubles that don't weigh the same. And Joe Embiid is the reason they won that series. And Tyrese Maxey stepping up, uh, Tobias being the best defensive version of himself I've seen in his entire life. I think those are the three bigger reasons they won those series. That, and also the fact that Danny Green played more like a throwback version of Danny Green than James Harden's consistent shooting and great play was. I'm not saying he sucked because he didn't suck by any stretch of the imagination. He just was definitely average for what you expect from James Harden, in my opinion. Yeah, I disagree. He had, he had 22 and 14 in game one. He had... He had 14 and 6 in game two, but I mean, that was a blowout, so he didn't play as much. Yeah, game that game three might 19, really about, but. Game three at 19 and 10. Game four at 22 and 9. Game five he did bad, but then game six he had 22 and 15. The first so game the last game, game five, he did fine, and the other I, ones, though, I don't think. Like, outside the thing of game is, five, I really don't think uh, it was no James Harden problem. His scoring numbers are fine, but he didn't shoot that great. Like, like you have to, you expect James Harden he's to be. He's never, he's never been a lockdown shooter. No, he's always been a guy that take, expect, like, there takes have a lot been of shots moments. and lives the talent. Yeah, there have been moments, though, that you would like him to take certain shots when he passed just because you know he would have made it where you're not going to get as many foul calls, which the Sixers have been the beneficiaries of getting more than most playoff teams. But you don't typically get as much in the postseason. And with Joel, who's the guy that draws the most fouls on the team uh, in the postseason, you, you're going to have to have James do that more, but his style are also less called fouls in the postseason. Well, Joel, if you're getting bullied like that down low, they're always going to call that foul if you go up into, and somebody starts knocking you down because of how aggressive you are down low. The way James Harden drives and kind of bounces off of people, they don't always call that in the postseason. So there's a different – like he's going to have to now being the mo- number one scorer play like he did – at his best with Houston, where we saw a couple playoff games. Because the biggest knock on James Harden in his career is he's been more of a regular season player. That is usually... Which has always been taken out of context. So, I mean, it has been taken out of context some, but also if you're, you're the guy that needs to step up, step the hell up. So there's also that. I mean, he, he does. I, I, again, he, that, that, that's something that's always like, been... He lost the Rockets that one game when he shot, was it like two for 25 or whatever? Like he literally shot like 15% from the floor. 
So like it's there are game out of like a hundred players. Oh, I understand, but there's Everybody's many got that examples game. of James Harden. My issue with James Harden is he has the alpha dog inside of him. He hasn't shown that consistently with the Sixers other than at the beginning. And even though you have Joel on the court, there's multiple teams in the league that have two different guys that you would consider potential number one scorers on other rosters. So like you, like I think he could be a little bit more of a scoring contributor, even with Joel on, but it, but it worked in the first round. But if he plays like he did in the first round with, with, before Joel comes back and they're not beating the heat unless if Jimmy's out and PJ Tucker's out and Tyler heroes out and Kyle Lowry's out because then by default, they don't have their best lineup. But if all those guys are in and, and Harden tries to play like Oscar Robertson and not James Harden, they're not beating the Miami heat. And that's just my opinion. I, 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 I disagree. I, I disagree. I, think he has played very well and he has I mean again outside of game five I think he's done everything you're asking him to do so I, mean, I don't think he's played bad he just hasn't played like himself like like that's why I'm comparing him to a completely different like he has you, would, you would never consider James Harden comparable to be a guy that was just a facilitator which is basically what Oscar Robertson was is one of the all-time great that's why I'm saying that because I'm not I'm not trying to say he sucked but it's just he again, has a, again he's in a di- he's just again done. he's in a different role He's in a different role again. Oh, yeah, but there's a degree to saying, is he going to be able to 100% be the alpha dog because he wasn't in that role with us this year? Now that Embiid's out, you have to get back into that mindset immediately. And he's been in a facilitator mindset. It's not necessarily the easiest thing to just flip. For some guys it is, but for a lot, it's probably not the easiest thing to flip that switch. I mean, he's... He did it with Brooklyn a few years ago when, when those guys were out and he helped them. He dropped 30 in that one game. I mean, again, it, it's it's a different role. I don't know what else to say. I mean, I mean, again, he had Chris Paul with him who ran the offense and he was he was the alpha dog to shoot. But, I mean, this, again, he's got Embiid now. His job is to facilitate the offense and get the ball down low. Again, now that Embiid's out, yes, he's going he's gonna to switch it. I mean, Doc Rivers even said yesterday. So, I mean, I, I think they'll be fine. And I'm honestly not as worried about it than a lot of other people in this series. Yeah, the other reason I'm worried is, and we're going to get into this, you need to have good defense against the Heat. I'm not worried now. I'm not worried about Danny because Danny stepped up and showed that he can be one of those veterans that still steps up in the playoffs, even though he realistically sucked in the regular season, Um, where that's a good thing to have. Thibault's reversed. Thibault was great in the regular season, and because of the fact that he couldn't play all the time, but also didn't do crap this far in the postseason. So you would like to see him step up his game to the degree we know he can at least be defensively. Whether he makes a couple shots or not is kind of something you can't expect a lot from Matisse yet at this point of his career. But you definitely can expect him to at least shut somebody down. And that game five, he was that's probably the worst game I've ever seen him play in his entire NBA career. And then the first two, it's not like he was greatly effective. The only reason he played a lot more minutes. His defense was good game in the first but, two. Yeah. But in the first, in the second game, it definitely wasn't. The first one, he played garbage well, we, minutes we, for a lot of them. Because that's the we game we did. Our de- like, I'm, not wor- I'm not worried about our defense. We'll match Miami's defense, no problem, in this series. I mean, that, that's how we, we well, really controlled the first two. In the first two games. Cause that's how, how we controlled the first. Five. That's how we controlled the first two games. Um, that's how we controlled the first two games against Toronto. Got out to a big lead. That's how we won game three. It was a defensive battle. Again, I mean, Dybul came back. I mean, game five was just ugly all around. And then game six, again, you, you blew him out 130 and you held him to under 100. So another great defensive game. So I'm, I'm not concerned about our defense at all. Like, the, the, the only big concern with this team, in my eyes, is the bench. Yeah, well, the bench is also starting now at center. So that would be a concern for me when it comes to defense because Paul Reed has played very good in the minutes he's got off the bench. The problem is now that he's probably going to play the starting minutes because DeAndre Jordan's practically looked like he was washed. So hopefully maybe he can step up in the playoff. Then you're going to have to figure something out there because you have a veteran that looks like he's washed 
And then you have Paul Reed, who hasn't played a magnified amount of minutes in the NBA yet. So there, there, there's certain things. I trust Paul Reed to play a good 10 to 13, 14 minutes. But when you push it past that, just because his body hasn't experienced that yet, you can't necessarily expect greatness after that. So it's going to be interesting to see uh, what comes of that because of how they match up with getting rebounds. Obviously, Adebayo and the Drain Demons of the world are not the biggest scorers on the offensive end of center. But both are good rebounders. And it's going to be interesting to see if, especially DeAndre Jordan. I honestly have more faith in Paul Reed than DeAndre Jordan. If DeAndre Jordan could out-rebound guys at this point of his career when he's just not that good anymore. Where Paul Reed, honestly, if I'm starting somebody, I would start him and let DeAndre come off the bench because I have way less faith in DeAndre Jordan at this point of his career than Paul Reed. But I don't know what your thoughts are on that. Matchup wise, I'm starting DeAndre Jordan. Um, you mentioned it. Their bigs aren't going to score. You need a rebounder. That's the, I mean, whether DeAndre Jordan's quote unquote, as people are saying, washed up, the one thing he is ever, always going to do is get rebounds. So I, I'm absolutely starting DeAndre Jordan here. I don't think Paul Reed's going to get more minutes than he usually does. I, I think they're going to mix in a three man center rotation. This is a series where Miami isn't a big team, they don't get major. Uh, in the paint presence from their bigs. Yeah, Jimmy Butler will hit some mid-range shots and that stuff. That's where Dybul and Green are going to come in on Butler. So this series, if there is a series and Embiid was going to miss the first two games, it would probably be this series that is, oh, now obviously, okay is the wrong word because you want to beat out there. But if there's a series, I'd be less, the least amount of worry, the least worried about is the way to phrase it, than other series, it would be this series because they don't have a Brook Lopez or they don't have, um, other bigs that other teams do. But this team, as you mentioned, their centers aren't going to score a whole lot of points. They're going to live off the rebounds. So I think you're going to get a three-man center center rotation. Well, who's the I third? It's gonna Bas- be, Bassey? Because Bassey's I, still banged nope. up. No, it's, I think it's going to be DeAndre Jordan, Paul Reed, and Paul Alsat are going to be the, the three bigs down low. Um, because, again, I, I think none of those guys have been stretched out recently. So I think it doesn't benefit this team to – try throwing a guy out there for 25 minutes. I just think, you're, like you said, they're not stretched out there yet. It's yeah. not realistic for this point. So I think you're better off just running those three, seeing who's the best matchup, and then obviously late in the game, you figure it out and, and see who's still got the legs and everything and what, whether you need what, what you need. I mean, if you're down by if you're down by three points with two minutes left and it's a timeout, yeah, yeah. I'm probably switching Paul Reed in, Reed in there for offense. But if if it's Two minutes left, you're up by five. I'm probably keeping Jordan in for rebounds and defense. So I don't think uh, – See, I think for me, DeAndre Jordan's here. just all rebounding at this point. Like, you hit him at that at the beginning. I don't think he's that great defensive anymore because he's just slow. Like it's And it's it, and it's just it's just the nature of your body deteriorating and you're old in the league now. I think if he can – if a guy drives directly at him, he's still going to – yeah, he's going to get blocks, but – like before in his prime, he was a guy that could move and get blocks down low. He can't really rotate to get the blocks anymore. I feel like that's the only reason why the, I agree with you. The three man rotation is best. I just disagree with who should start because I feel like Paul Reed has shown me stuff on the defensive end in that DeAndre Jordan just can't do anymore because he can't move at the level he used to move in his younger body. And that's kind of, the only reason I'm starting Paul Reed is not because I think DeAndre doesn't like deserve to get the start as a veteran. It's more I just think at this point he's basically a rebound guy, and that's it because of just the limitations of what his his body allows him to do at this point of his of his career. And the same goes for Paul Millsap. Paul Millsap's more of a mid range shooter if he can make the shots at this point, and can't unfortunately be his bully ball down low. He's never a bully ball guy, but his ability to be good down low is much just because he's not as quick as he once was. So, like, both of those guys are veterans that are nice to have rotated in the rotation. I think you're just more confident in the rotation than me because I'm not that confident in Millsap and Jordan, except for the fact that if they can step up like Danny Green did because they're veterans and have been in the playoffs before, but both have not shown much to be to write home about, I guess is a good way to put it, in this particular season at the end of the, in the twilights of their careers. So it's going to be interesting to see how they step up. I have the most confident, honestly, confidence in Paul Reed of all three of those people, even though he's the youngest guy. Yeah, I, I see what you're saying. I just think because of the matchups with the Heat and the way their bigs are, like Biombo's more of a Jordan type. He's not going to be, if it was a more speed 
more uh, faster center. Then, yeah, I'd agree with Paul Reed. But I, I think the size there is going to be difficult for Reed against a guy like him. Uh, I do like Reed. I like his potential. But I think he's more of a stretch four rather than a center. I think that's where Sixers need to get a, a true backup set. And I know obviously they had one in Drummond. Um, but, I mean, Paul Reed, I think, is like 6'9", six, 6'8". Six, so I, I think that's where that hurts him a little bit against some of those guys. So I, th- I just think this matchup-wise, again, if, if depending on the team, it would be different. But I think with the way the Heat are, are shaped up, and I don't think you can go wrong with either. I, I really don't think it's a huge difference at this point, like you said, in Jordan's career and even Millsap's. Uh, so I, I don't think it's anything too crazy in that sense. But I, I think – and that's another thing is I like uh, – when it comes to playoff time, I like the veteran experience stuff. So I don't want Reed to get too overwhelmed. Even if it's just Jordan starting for three minutes and they switch Reed in, I, I just think that messes with a young guy's head. So That's a fair point. Jordan's that been there. Point. Jordan's been there before. Might as well just give him the, the opening few minutes. I don't think it's going to be that big. And obviously, you can change it quickly. No, that is a fair point. That's a good way to put it. You could start him and then change it quickly. Um, for me, I. I, I see it's interesting with how Joel because I see exactly I completely agree with what you're saying about down low people. It's just my concern is with two guys that are at the twilights of their careers and how you said Paul Reed is more of a stretch, but he has impressed me at defense, but you have limitations when you're six nine. You do have a couple guys on the heat, especially Jimmy Butler, that are kind of those pump fake go right at you guys. So if it, and and so is Lowry at this point of his career. Then and then he'll pull up and do the mid range if he's healthy. So you have and then all the depot will drive. You're going to have to have one of those guys consistently if the driver gets past the guard. Stop those guys coming into the paint as well. Where Joel is obviously the best candidate to stop all of that, and we just know for a fact he would. I would say with all three of these guys, we do not know for a fact that they're going to step up and stop the driver if they pump fake the guard or if they do one of those quick dribble moves and accelerate uh to get past that that would be my biggest concern matchup on the heat is that with our center issues not the center on center matchups it's more the centers when the guards drive and beat we know is going to stop everybody these others we don't necessarily know if they're going to be able to have the greatest help defense too because they're in the twilight of the careers i can't blame them and one because that's not necessarily his strength to his game and Paul Reed, who's still developing into the league also. So there's two factors why you can't expect a lot from somebody like him. You just have to expect what he's been giving consistently, which is good, consistent 10 to like 12 minutes span. Yeah, I agree with that. But that's the, that's the only matchup because I completely agree with you. Center to center matchup doesn't concern me that much because Vada Bio, there's a couple games in his career, obviously, where her start making the mid range more, her knock down like a three or two. And he has those runs, but it's not like he's consistently a great scoring center. So, like, like hopefully he doesn't turn into um, what's his name from the Celtics against us, uh, Baines or whatever it is. Yeah, right. the, but um, like that usually, yeah, that. you shouldn't even have to uh, worry about that when it comes to him. So we definitely agree with the down low, but something that we should get into now as we wrap up uh, the final, I would say, 15 minutes or so of this one is our keys to the series. We talked about a bunch of different players on both sides and their injury, health stuff, uh, how we think matchups work. Um, I think now we could just get into, like, the bare bones, what, what our keys are, who on the Sixers needs to step up, and who on the Heat we think are going to really step up the Sixers are going to have to just – basically limit and then let everybody else beat them type guys, which I think we know who that is on the heat. But, um, like, we can get into all of those things. So I'll turn it over to you. Uh, what would be your three main keys to the series? And then if you also want to add at the end of your three main keys, your three main players to the series before um, – to the start of the series. And, and then because obviously Joel's a main player, so leave him out of it since we don't know exactly when he's coming back, then you can do that as well. Yeah, uh, first, my first key to the series, and it sounds probably like the most obvious one, or one of the most obvious ones, but fast starts. That's one thing I did not like in the Toronto series. I think you got away with because it was Toronto. It was all the comebacks we had. And I, I think that's something you're not going to be able to do against Miami. I think they're veterans on that team. It's not like it's it's Siakam, Fred Van Vliet, and all them. It's 
Jimmy Butler, who's been around for a while, who's a good closer. It's Kyle Lowry, who's won a championship uh, already uh, in his NBA tenure and has been on some pretty good teams as well. He's been around for a while. So these guys, you're, you're going to have to get a quick start. You're going to have to have to battle back and forth rather than going down 10, 11 points, calling back in the game. So that's my first one. He's got the fast starts and control the game. My second one is bench. I mean, we can we can sit here and discuss it all we want. We mentioned that the center – with now with them beat out, but even but even outside of that, I mean, there's that was part of the game five until like obviously with blowouts until they put the backups in and they played the last five minutes. Your bench only had two points. You're not going to win any games, especially in this Heat series, when your bench only has two four points a game. So it's I need to see more from the bench. Whether it's and I mean I know Niang's been hit and miss all year, but I need to see a guy like Shake Milton or. Um, I mean, some, a guy like Thibel, I mean, again, his defense obviously is going to be there. I'm not worried about that, but he's got to be able to score a little bit more. And you saw when Harden first got it, it was them creating his backdoor cuts. I'm, I'm interested to see if they try to do that a little bit more. Uh, so, yeah, I'd say quick start, bench, and then my third one would be I limit play, play to our own pace. I felt like we, we tried to speed it up a little bit more than we should have at times. I know we like the run a little bit sometimes, but but it seems like we play better when we control it. We settle down and we play at our own pace, and when we rush ourselves, we we, we get turnover happy. So I'd say uh, pace of play is a big one. So I'm gonna go. Yeah, that's my threes. I'm gonna go quick, fast start, bench, and pace of play. Control the pace. Yeah, I definitely agree with all three of those because uh, one of my main things was gonna be uh, it's kind of the similar with the pace of play. Don't get erratic at times was yeah. going to be one of mine, which is kind of the same things. But sometimes I think the Sixers will try to make too cute of a pass or like too cute of a play where you're like, just keep it simple. That's what's been getting you here the whole damn game. What are you doing? And like that, that, that'll just like make you be watching the game and you're just sitting there going like, but, or like ripping your hair, like whatever expression you want to say. So like that that would definitely also be one of my keys because they play so well. And the only reason this team ever has throughout the regular season um, let teams come back in the games is that. They're just all of a sudden start playing or it's the bench. Like, and you, so you hit the, but it's either they play too erratic or the bench comes in and doesn't provide enough uh, off of the bench. And, and so I, I definitely agree with um those keys uh, for sure. Um, I think one to add for me uh, would definitely be the continued best defense we've seen, I think, from him in his career of Tobias Harris. Tobias Harris also scored a lot in the first two games. He was good in the other game. Tobias was good in every game of the series. But I just think Tobias Harris, because of how good he can shoot, sometimes should just realize he should shoot more. And that and that's not necessarily a knock. That's more just me thinking he could be even better because he's having a good shooting percentage game. And just because James Harden's more the name brand, he's still passing it to James Harden. And I'm like, well, if you're having a better game than James, I have no problem with you shooting more shots than James Harden. Like other people might, but I... 